Yeah, this, that's sort of like the dog <laughs> campaign. Yeah, man, that's, well, it's, after, after, it's working. After an hour, it's just uh, we'll say, would you mind repeating everything that you just said? It's recording. It's recording. All okay. right. <laughs> anyway, sum up Dolan Bush in, in that period. Um, and, and maybe even, in a wider sense, I mean, what was the what was the significance of the Bush presidency? The significance of the Bush presidency, from Dole's standpoint, or just well, both. generally, yeah. yeah. Both. I mean, That's... I mean, the the yeah, the relationship between Dole and Bush it was remarkable, given how they went into it, and and, and my guess is uh, that has a lot to do with Dole's personal resilience, and the fact is that Dole tends not to have grudges, and obviously uh, Bush, to some extent. Uh, you think they was, both worked at that? Yeah, I think they both worked at that. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, Dole demonstrated uh, loyalty and passion for, for trying to advance the, the president's agenda. And I think that was real and, uh, and not just feigned or going through the motions. And, and that was appreciated by Bush, and, and they built on that. So. Yeah. And uh, the uh, you can just set that here. We were talking about the significance of the presidency, uh, the Bush presidency, and 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 you ask a uh, historian's kind of question well. uh, <laughs> of what the significance of the Bush presidency is. Uh, I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, yeah. uh, I think that uh, maybe it will, will be better regarded in the future as it than it was uh, immediately afterwards. There was a lot of complaint by conservatives that uh, of his breaking the tax pledge and increasing uh, regulation. Uh, and, and that that fracture within the Republican Party and, and particularly among conservatives, that obviously had to have uh, implications for Dole, right. for Dole's ambitions. How did he, or, or how did he not, sort of ride that? Well, of course, he wasn't uh, part of the, the tax increaser crowd at that moment. Uh, I mean, he had been fatally burned by not taking the tax pledge before that, so that going into 96... Uh, a, a Western man would not have hesitated probably to observe something along those lines when, uh, when the president, in effect, jettisoned his uh, no-new taxes pledge. Right. And so uh, when we s we w thought we were running in 96 against Phil Graham and spent almost all of our opposition research on Phil Graham, yeah. and uh, uh, I think Senator Dole was trying to position uh, the structure of the Senate Finance Committee so that Phil Graham didn't get on it. Now... Uh, unlike today, where uh, the leader actually has some control over some of those appointments, at that time it was strictly an operation of seniority. So the only way that uh, you could really block Phil Graham is to get people that were more senior than he to uh, to come on the committee. And I think that uh, that our leader attempted to try to get people to do it, but a person like Domenici, who was clearly more senior, uh, didn't want to give up appropriations. And because of the, uh, the, the fact that if you're on finance, you have to give up other uh, uh, exclusive committees like uh, appropriations or armed services or... Uh, w would there have been bad blood... Uh between Dole and uh, Graham, um, had they not been prospective 
opponents for 96. I don't think the bad blood, and I don't know how bad the blood really was. I mean, I think it was, uh, Dole was. I mean, they're both prickly. They're both prickly, and uh, I don't think that, that they have a natural affinity. Hmm. Uh, Phil Graham is is a uh, sort of blinders right down the middle, uh, with a touch of the academic, and 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 not not really a naturally social guy. I mean, uh, you know, <clears throat> his he he had a harder time. Uh, um, I think engaging in chit chat. He was mainly let's let's talk about this and and move forward with that. It was interesting. We put all of our money in in offices in research uh, against him, and he folded so fast. And and he came to New Hampshire, and endorsed Dole in New Hampshire. Oh. And and that, I think, had nothing to do with Dole. And it had to do with Buchanan it said something yeah, unkind about uh, Wendy Graham. Really? And I think he was so furious with that that he decided he was going to endorse Dole because of the, the sort of the hurtful, perceived hurtful things that he said about huh. uh, well, let's Wendy. Well, let's back up. I mean, coming out of uh, 92, well, first of all, give me a sense of the Dole-George Mitchell relationship. Well, Sheila is going to be better than this because okay. as you recall, I I came back to private law practice uh, at the end of 86 and I was uh, during uh, the early Bush years, of course, I was in, in the Bush administration where I never expected to be uh, <coughs> having from my lot with uh, Bob Dole and yeah. given it my all and decided in August uh, of 1988 that uh, that that was that and it was safe to buy a new house <laughs> with a private sector mortgage and I did that in August of 88 and uh, uh, didn't anticipate going in the administration <laughs> which would have <laughs> <laughs> which had a hard time supporting that mortgage for uh, for very long. So I, in uh, by '92, uh, I was back here at at Covington. So I mean, the sort of the day to day thing, Sheila would be better. Okay. Uh, so in terms of preparing for '96. So what are the origins of that? Was it just always assumed well, you know, that it was, was going to happen? Or well, it was kind of funny. I remember, uh, I think Bob Lighthizer and I sat down with Dole at some point. Uh, uh, you know, maybe been in the early 90s, and uh, it didn't occur to me that he was going to run again. Hmm. Just because, because of age? Yeah, yeah, because of his age, and, you know, he'd taken the shot, and... and uh, I remember Bob and I sort of said, so who are we going to support in 96? And he said, how about me? And that was the first time I really perceived that he was very actively thinking about running. Uh, and and uh, we had a core of people that put together, you know, the, uh, the sort of the Dole team and went back to people from 88 and gathered others. And we had a pretty, I mean, you know, we were able to build on, you know, if I was the national head of lawyers for Dole, we were able to build on the people that we had and uh, and really build a very effective organization for uh, of lawyers for Dole. And, and we took, you know, highly paid lawyers and turned them into uh, sort of field workers. But one of the things that we did, uh, having watched when you bring a bunch of uh, highly educated, skilled people into a campaign. The campaign doesn't know what to do with all of these people. Uh, uh, one of the things that we did before every primary and we asked for volunteers to go up, we sent Nina Oviedo up a week in advance 
and had her work with the campaign and figure out what jobs were there and coordinate the jobs so that when we sent people up there, they wouldn't be just sort of saying, oh, we don't know what you do, or, you know, uh, just flounder around. She had it all organized, so I said, okay, I need 10 people on the this uh, to do, f- you know, phone bank work. I need somebody to uh, to be calling the the radio stations. I need somebody to be putting out signs and build, you know, going to the hardware store and getting stuff and putting them out in this county or that. That worked very well, and that was the benefit of having had the experience of uh, of having people take off their valuable time and <laughs> and not being able to figure out what to do with them once they get there. What had changed between 88 and 96? And well, how had Dole changed? Well, I mean, he, he obviously uh, was a... Uh, sort of more mature candidate. I think he still had the same fire in his belly for for where to go. Uh, you know, I... He wanted it as much as ever. I think he wanted it as much as ever. Uh, I think that... Uh, why did he want it? Guys, that's a, that's a real interesting question of why people pursue this uh, at, and, and give so much of themselves to... Uh, Get a job that. I mean, did you ever sense that it it was because he had an agenda he wanted to uh, implement, or uh, and and I don't mean that. I don't mean that the way it sounds. Yeah, I I mean, I I suspect a lot of people run for president. I don't think it was. uh, You know, here I I I want to. Ronald Reagan sort of had an agenda uh, Mm. of things that he wanted to uh, to do in a big picture. I think that uh, Bob Dole. Sort of had a vision that uh, that he was a uh, very skilled policy guy and would be able to lead the country in an effective way, but not because I want to accomplish this, 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 and this. Was I mean, there ever any thought given? And I'm bi- I bias him because I have, I have a dog in this hunt. Was ever any thought given to? proactively turning the age issue inside out by saying, I want to be a one-term president. Uh, and the idea being, as a one-term president who doesn't have to, unlike Bill Clinton, who spends all his time thinking about politics and thinking about getting reelected. I mean, I could actually, I mean, it, it could actually fit into the whole profile of, you know, this is my last mission and, you know, I, I don't want to do... A, you know, well, politics as usual. Uh, I mean, uh, whether there was any thought given, he never ran on that basis. So, but it, was it ever? I mean, did you ever hear any discussion at all? I didn't hear it. Th- yeah. I mean, obviously, I thought about it uh, given his age. But I mean, look at McCain now. He's he's a really old guy running. And but he's but it's it's a factor in. I mean, yeah. I think it's reinforcing other factors. I mean, one one aspect of Dole's age and health that did have a direct impact was uh, who we who we selected as vice president and uh, how we went about that. Because uh, I was asked uh, by Senator Dole to uh, serve on the vice presidential selection. We first had a little task force, and it was. Uh, Bob Ellsworth, uh, myself, uh, what's his name, uh, Reed, Scott, Scott Reed, and uh, oh, uh, Tom Carlogas' wife, uh, Ann McLaughlin. Ann McLaughlin. Oh, sure. Was we and we had some. Meetings to discuss this, and Dole sort of said he wanted to have somebody who would be a, a 10. Uh, now, when you look at it in terms of experience, foreign policy, uh, you know, and if you look at somebody who's a 10, uh, from that standpoint, we talked about Cheney, for instance, having those qualities. But Cheney was a complete non-starter 
because of the health issue. He had multiple heart attacks. He looked less healthy then in 96 than he does today. He was heavier and just didn't look like a healthy guy. But he had, I mean, you know, he'd been a White House chief of staff. Sure. He'd been a congressman, been a cabinet officer. Uh, he had, he had no those kinds of credentials. But, but we had a very explicit uh, health hurdle because we imagined that there would be the TV or radio ad that said we're only one week heartbeat away from Newt Gingrich being president of the United States. <laughs> and we thought that was probably a, a very telling <laughs> telling uh, argument because Newt Gingrich was not at the height of let's, his possible. Let's step back. Yeah. Yeah. What, what is the Dole-Gingrich relationship during this period? Well, I think it was probably, yeah, uh, you know, I think it was sort of a workmanlike but uh, not warm. I don't think it ever has been warm since Gingrich attacked Dole as the tax collector for the welfare state. They they have sort of different styles. I mean, Dole's not, uh, he tends to get along with everybody, and I think that he did get along with everybody. There was some tension I could tell because I was talking Sheila re- uh, regularly, and this was, I think, one of the critical uh, sort of things that sunk us, uh, why we ultimately weren't successful. But the big shutdown of government was Gingrich pushing it, and Dole didn't want to do it. But Dole couldn't afford to openly split with Gingrich because he was still very much in doubt as to whether he could capture the right wing of the party. And so he was sort of trapped because he didn't didn't want to have the right wing attack him and go. But what what happened is that 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 shutdown of the government rehabilitated Clinton, who had been terribly unpopular before. And Clinton had the whole middle of the electorate open to him. While we were still running for yeah. uh, for the it, right wing, isn't that a metaphor in all in a sense for the whole campaign? That Dole was in some ways cornered, limited by this constant need to protect his right flank, and 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 and, and, and not just a economic conservatives, but now clearly cultural and religious Culture, conservatives. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and again, I mean. My bias here, I remember, I'll never forget, when Time Magazine called and said, we've got this memo that you wrote to Senator Dole, which was basically, you know, from the, what used to be moderate wing of the party. But it was, but it was also suggested that, I think it said pointedly, you were a better candidate in 88 because you were yourself and that this feeding the crocodile is is when did you write that it was in the summer of 95 and i'll tell you it was the issue when colin powell i guess withdrew um i mean right before that i think time magazine actually time may have put dole on its cover that week but but this was the new story, was this, you know, battle for the soul of Bob Dole. And, um, and I intended it for no eyes but his. And I subsequently learned 99% that he was the one who leaked it. He told me, <laughs> no, listen, he told me, no, more important, he didn't tell me, he told the press that he kept the memo on his desk, looked at it every day, Send it over to the campaign. You can imagine how many friends that made me, yeah. you know, over there. And like, yeah. who's this busybody from outside mucking up with our perfect strategy, you know? Which, and I can put myself in those shoes. Um, George Will attacked me on the, on, on the Brinkley show. He had Dole on, and he reads this story, you know? And, of course, Dole is sort of backpedaling as fast as he can. Uh, and, of course, Maury is in the middle of all this. Right. Because she's the personification of, of this strategy, the, the, you know, the Hollywood speech and everything else. Mm-hmm. And the problem was he wasn't a good enough actor 
or he wasn't enough of a hypocrite, in my opinion, to make it look authentic. No, no, that's and I, true. I thought he was in danger of losing his authenticity. Well, he and, he he isn't a good actor, and he tends to be just. Uh, maybe it's his Midwest upbringing, but he tends to be pretty straightforward and uh, and not with uh, with uh, as much acting and guile as uh, many politicians. I mean, remember the disastrous State of the Union response? Yes. Oh, yes. Do I remember? Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> all right. see, remember? this is all part. All right. Tell yeah. me your account of the of the. <laughs> Uh, you know, to some extent, I've tried to put that uh, put that out of my mind because it, it, it wasn't just a bad speech for Dole. I think it's one of the worst rebuttals that I've seen, and and uh, uh, I don't think I, I didn't have. It wasn't like I was hurt to the quick because uh, my ideas were thwarted or whatever. They, they, uh, it was just, I wasn't a player in that. Uh, and and w what was the dynamic, uh, I mean, I, I don't mean to point fingers, uh, I mean, Maury may be too convenient a target, but. Well, but I think that. Maury was, <laughs> yeah. was the. the uh, <laughs> Maybe she's too convenient a target because <laughs> she is the logical. Yeah. I mean, who else in the campaign, you know, would have that kind of strategic... Uh, yeah, I, I think that uh, that was, I think, it, you know, there may have been some others that contributed, but I think the majority of the, the honors would go to her. And did he, once the speech was delivered, did he realize that it was a bomb? Yeah, but I I wasn't of uh, as a general matter sort of saying. Oh no no I'm not saying yeah, you. Gee, yeah. I just say, that, did he that was, did he know? I, I think a, he knew, and uh, and we all knew, and, it, and of course you know you get critiqued in uh, in the press, and and if anything they were kind. Actually, you know they were. I yeah. mean, relatively speaking. Yeah. But that I mean that's why I'm wondering this. Was there a tug of war going on within the campaign between, say, you know, this let Dole be Dole camp and the... Well, I mean, uh, the, the, the problem with the let Dole be Dole is uh, I think there really was a great deal of uh, uncertainty as to whether he would get the nomination if he took a, yeah, a yeah, left left or a moderate approach, and he really had to run for the hearts and minds of the conservatives. But but that suggests an answer to the question, what had changed between 88 and 96? I mean, it sounds as if, I mean, this was a process that had been going forward. Yeah. Now you had Gingrich, and you had a Republican Congress, and the contract with America and all of this. I mean, the party had, had really veered even more. More, and, and also I think he probably learned from '88. He says, "I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get snookered on the tax pledge." Or, uh, and and it, and you know, I think the election was lost by uh, March or April, uh, and and that's because Clinton had an opportunity to rehabilitate himself. Yeah. By March, when we actually got the nomination. We'd had an unprecedented amount of negative advertising, courtesy uh, of our friend from New Jersey, that was directed at Dole to tear Dole down. You know, I think you know eight or nine or ten million dollars of negative advertising that was directed uh, and directly at Dole. And too. And he had no money. And by How March, did that happen? Well, I mean, I, you know, you just spent it all on the uh, on getting the nomination, and the nomination was contended by uh, Buchanan. For did you ever sit around? I mean, Buchanan seems in, then even more than against Bush, and to put it mildly, an improbable opponent. But. If you uh, 
if you look at a very hard right uh, electorate, that is the Republican primary voters, I think he had a lot more appeal to, to that group than he would to any other segment of the electorate. But, and, and, but Forbes had been a significant... But Forbes was the one that really did damage to Dole more than Buchanan. Da Buchanan didn't do damage to Dole in, in a long-term sense, but Forbes running that much negative advertising against Dole, and then you end up in March and you have no money, and Clinton's got all of his money, so we had to rely on the RNC to sort of fill in the gap. Uh, you know, just look at those factors. Uh, it was only, I only looked at it this way after the election when I went to the, the John F. Kennedy School of Government does a sort of recap of the election. They invite people from campaigns, and I went up to that and listened to the Clinton's people, their analysis of what they were doing and how they were able to win. It made me feel better because I realized it wasn't just we could have done something better. We had forces operating against us that we had to fight a primary. We had to go to the right. He had the center. He had the money. We were out of money. They knew we were out of money. Uh, what was Dole's mood? Did you know? How did his mood fluctuate? Well, he. By and large, because seems in a lot of ways it had been pretty frustrating. Uh, yeah, but but on the other hand, he he seemed uh, pretty even keeled and uh, not quite the Hubert Humphrey happy warrior. But uh, yeah. but given how uphill the fight was, unexpectedly seemed, uphill. Yeah, yeah. He, uh, you know. I mean, it was Forbes? Uh, do you think in Iowa? Forbes was a major yeah. factor in terms right. of... And then we lost, we lost New Hampshire again, and I, I don't think I'll ever go to New Hampshire again for any presidential election. I hate it. I, and I've, I've never supported anybody that's ever won in New Hampshire. <laughs> the people are surly. Yeah. Uh, it's so over overkill. And, and uh, so I went right from New Hampshire and then went down to South Carolina where we basically saved the campaign. Right. You know, South Carolina saved it, just in the same way that it did for... Uh, what is it about South Carolina? Why is it... It seems to be a much more establishmentarian well, well, party. Let, let, me, let me just sort of <coughs> reflect on this. Uh, when you go, as I have uh, several times, to New Hampshire, and you call people on the phone, number one, the people from New Hampshire, by and large are kind of surly people anyway. But after they've been called a hundred times, yeah. well, they're extra surly. In, oh, thank you. In, in, uh, yeah. in South Carolina, even, uh, number one, they haven't been called a hundred times. But even if they don't want to talk to you, they're uh, polite and, uh, and nicer. I think that... Uh, uh, it's it's Is a that's pretty going over into Iowa, by the way. It's a that same it's syndrome. A, the New Hampshire I think syndrome. I think I think maybe the New, they they seem to be yeah, quite vexed if if they haven't met the candidate in person and you know they're sort of very demanding kind of people. Whereas in South Carolina, I mean, one of the things that we were able to do in South Carolina is it turns out that there's. Uh, not an insignificant Jewish population in South Carolina and very old Jewish congregations in Charleston, in Columbia, in Greenville. And uh, oddly, the South Carolina primary is on a Saturday oh. rather than a Tuesday. And uh, Buchanan had just come out with his book where he seemed to be praising Hitler. So we called every rabbi in the state... <coughs> And said, "You're going to have an election uh, on Saturday, yeah." And we got a lot of commentary, yeah, on Friday evening services, and 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 we worked those that we had somebody who's active with the Holocaust Commission, mm -hmm. and uh, is it a different kind of party though? I mean, I sense, uh, you know, 
Thurmond and the Carol Campbell. It, it seems like a more hierarchical, yes, tightly structured party in South Carolina. Than, we also than had the Christian here. Coalition okay. actively working on our behalf. Ralph Reed and yeah. it turned out that that group on yep. our behalf as opposed to uh, and that that's a, another huge factor. I mean you have the hierarchy, you had the we we had the Jewish community locked up and we had the the Christian community locked up, the the Christian and that was a pretty pretty probably in South Carolina is well organized and uh, oh. an active group as anywhere <coughs> in the South. Well, then, I mean, to you know, to be fair, to bend over backwards to be fair, then w would you say the Hollywood speech, for example, had a payoff? I mean, down yeah. the road? Yeah, yeah. That was your firewall, South Carolina. Yeah. And, and interestingly, it was for George W. Bush. Do you Is buy the notion... That the, the Republican Party. The weather's party. also nicer there. Uh, <laughs> I ruined my best favorite pair of shoes in the first time in uh, New Hampshire because it snowed and they got all screwed up. And do you buy the idea that that the Republican Party is just more hierarchical and that um, there is a kind of um, natural order? I mean, you, you wait in line well, and, and you... Uh, you I think that the Republican Party it. generally, it's not just South Carolina, but there is sort of this notion that uh, it, that there's some kind of sense of uh, you've paid your dues, you're entitled to, to get the slot. Now, it seems to be uh, this particular primary right now seems to be so wide open that it's, it may be that no one's paid their dues. Or, or that's breaking down. If, if maybe if you'd say any, anything, it would be uh, McCain. But well, on the other hand, McCain was viewed as not a party loyalist uh, in the last go round. So, was there a moment uh, in '96? I mean, not walking into the fall, but in terms of, was there a moment when you're sitting in a room and it sort of dawned on you that you know we we could lose this nomination? Oh yeah, yeah. I, I don't. I, I don't. I didn't. I didn't think it was. I thought that we still, uh, at all points, had a good chance. But I didn't. I personally didn't count it in the the bank. Maybe it was just the '88 experience where, <laughs> and what where we where what? we won Iowa and and, and the pollster Dole, told us we were going to win New Hampshire. And if it wasn't Dole, who who would it have been? Well, you know, it's hard to imagine. I wasn't going to be Forbes or Buchanan. Yeah, but. you can't imagine either of those guys. Um, now, you won, what was it, uh, Super Tuesday. When that, right, You yeah. basically won the nomination yeah. that night. Had had a, well, two things. Had, had a vice presidential search already begun? No. And no, what really. about the platform? I mean, was there... At what point did that begin to really? Be that, an issue? That, I don't think that because uh, the media certainly tried to to make abortion a source of of conflict within the party. I don't think either the platform or the vice president stuff really got underway until after the nomination was secured. I mean, after all, we had. A goodly period of time when uh, well. didn't have any money to do anything else but sit around and examine our navels on uh, on that. And I don't I don't remember exactly when it was that Dole appointed this vice presidential team, but it was. Can you think of like you mentioned Cheney? I mean, you can think of I remember some time Engler was mentioned. At well, one point. well, I, I'll tell you exactly. Yeah. I mean, we we set up this sort of grid and tried to evaluate people and and the qualities that uh, that were attractive. Health, perfect health was a was a requirement. He would like to have had somebody who had significant military service, which was in, is increasingly difficult. Uh, but did that rule out practically rule out women? 
No, I mean, no, we had a sort of a whole separate uh, enterprise of, of trying to think of women uh, and brainstorm about women uh, to uh, to put women in the uh, in the pool that we were looking at, and and we we would just sort of throw out names on this group, and 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 we had a whole grid of uh, of names and pluses and minuses and do some evaluation and background work on, you know, maybe 50, 60, 70 mm -hmm. people. Uh, and that and was, then... And was Colin Powell ever approached or...? Well, I don't... I think he was approached to, uh, early on before we got too far into this and he said he wasn't interested, so he was really never uh, a... Uh, a viable candidate just because he'd taken himself out of the running. Uh, and Cheney was never, I mean, we sort of looked at him. Uh, and Rumsfeld was a guy with, sort of perceived with the vast experience. Uh, uh, Are you worried you know, about that being too much Washington? I mean, Dole being the consummate Washington insider. The, that a Cheney or... Well, I mean, yeah. just to think about it, Cheney was then running uh, Halliburton. Hmm. He was in Texas. He'd been out of Washington for a while. Um, and and Rumsfeld, the same. I mean, he, you know, he was running Searle. Yeah. Uh, 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 that's the, in the campaigns, the only time I ever saw uh, Rumsfeld and, and, to be honest, I was quite unimpressed. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. But what was his ostensible role? He was kind of like a uh, sort of one of the leaders in terms of I forget how the title worked, but he was supposed to be uh, uh, somebody who was leading the effort, and he brought in some guy who was just sort of Mister uh, Bean Counter. Uh, we got a put everything in a memo with this format kind of stuff and I don't think it added any value at all that yeah. I could see. But uh, in the vice presidential search, the very first person that he talked to, uh, we I developed a, a questionnaire that people would, would have to uh, respond to and I sort of started with the questionnaire that uh, um, they used for presidential appointees, and then I th added things to that that uh, the were sort of political mm. kinds of things. For instance, have you ever paid for an abortion? Have you ever personally been? You know, those sure. kind of questions aren't on the president, but uh, <laughs> and I just sort if of you don't ask him, someone else will. Uh, you know, I just tried <laughs> to think of what what potentially embarrassing issues sure. weren't covered by that. Uh, and then uh, sort of the pattern was that we would talk about somebody and when somebody he was pretty serious about, he would call them on the phone and ask them to meet with me if they had any interest. And the first person that I talked to was uh, the governor of Pennsylvania, Tom Ridge. Tom Ridge, who was a combat veteran in Vietnam, he lost part of his hearing there. Uh, and was highly regarded. Yeah, I mean, and and I flew up uh, one Sunday to his home in Erie and talked with he and his wife, and uh, I was very favorably impressed by him. He he was a nice fellow. My family settled about thirty miles south of Erie, <coughs> and, and I have some distant relatives that run a business, uh, the manufacturing business that make channel lock pliers uh, right near where my family, they happen to be named DeArmond, and they actually turned out to be fairly big supporters of Ridge. So. <laughs> uh, but before I sent him the form and he just about the same time called back and said, 
on balance, he wasn't interested. And so then I think my next foray to talk to people was the spin through the Midwest where I got a road atlas and started calling these governors to try to figure out where I was going to go. And and since I had a plane at my disposal, uh, you know, I could make appointments and... Angler? Tommy Thompson, I assume? Uh, Angler, Tommy Thompson, no. Uh, John, uh, Illinois, Wainovich. Uh, Jim Edgar? No, it was not Jim Edgar. It was... Uh, yeah, it was Jim Edgar. Yeah, the, the, he was a tall, thin guy. Yeah. Who uh, we met in Springfield. We met uh, Angler at his summer, the governor's Up summer home in Mackinac, in, in Mackinac Island, <laughs> yeah. and flew in with his light plane yeah, at midnight. Very much plane, and they, they could uh, turn the runway lights on remotely. They did that. We <laughs> landed, they buttoned the plane up. And then we get the taxi, which is a horse-drawn clip, 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 clip. <laughs> so, uh, and and Voinovich was oh, yeah. governor of Ohio, and we caught him on the way back. So I I talked to those four. We talked to uh, Governor Campbell, who was then at the ACLI, and just actually uh, only a brief distance from here. So his. Uh, uh, and then we uh, we looked at McCain, we looked at uh, Connie Mack, Nichols, <coughs> and I met with all of those people. Uh, there was uh, those were sort of later. Uh, the Edgar got booted fairly early on, I think. Does it help? Well, he had had some heart heart attacks. He was a health fitness guy. He ran all the time. Yes. And and, uh, we had uh, Sheila and and our friend uh, Dr. Peck look at the health files. I got medical files from people. Mm -hmm. And and it shows the difference between somebody who has no training like me. I look at it and say, this looks pretty good. His cholesterol is pretty low. And Chuck Peck says it should be low. He's on about three times the uh, recommended dosage for of uh, some statin like Lipitor. Of course, he would have recognized that it was just <laughs> artificially yeah. depressed. And it, yeah. At any rate, uh, then, uh, I mean, we had talked about Kemp early on, and it was kind of rejected. And, and interestingly... Scott Reed, who worked for Kemp, was not very supportive of, of going to Kemp. And there were a lot of negatives that Kemp had in terms of being a, sort of a uncontrolled guy, you know, all of the, the potential negatives. And to, uh, I think that, uh, you know, we had narrowed it down to about four people. Um, Engler, Thompson, um, Connie Mack, uh, I think maybe McCain. And uh, and I think that when he looked at all those choices, he, you know, and we did another round and people came in and we talked with them again, uh, I think he just didn't think that there was much excitement in, in that list. And uh, he, he made a little, he had a conversation with, uh, oh, uh, Secretary of Education who wrote the Book of Virtues. Uh, Bill Bennett. Bill Bennett. And uh, when I sent the form to Bill Bennett, he quickly withdrew. And 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 maybe we know later why, because he has he you know he had a major gambling problem. Uh, 
would have been unattractive. That's apparently one of the virtues. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> if you win, that, that would if be you a win, sort of an un, unattractive uh, <laughs> bit of hypocrisy. Yeah. Uh, and so then Kemp came up. Really, I mean, we hadn't we had talked about it before. And with respect to everybody that got fairly seriously uh, interested, we had a team here that that did computer research and, and you know with the internet it sort of it enables you to find out to troll for dirt. Yeah, yeah. In fact there's a there was a website I had somebody else that did this uh, uh, a young lawyer who was really quite good at it. Uh, and he said there's a place called the skeleton closet where they report uh, adverse stuff yeah. on on people that are Potential candidates. So, uh, so all of a sudden, Kemp is back in our uh, sights and, and going to the top, but not decided. Uh, and I remember, geez, you know, we had almost no time to uh, to look at it, and we we're scrambling to uh, have people review his taxes and look at all of this stuff. Uh, and there were some potential issues uh, in terms of uh, adultery and that sort of thing that uh, were rumors that were out there. Uh, indeed, I didn't have to go very far to uh, have that corroborated by somebody that worked for me. Hmm. Quite... Uh, a surprise, yeah. Um, but I remember uh, getting the materials to get it together. My job was to then go pick up the person, and so I have a plane waiting for me at Dulles Airport to uh, go do this. And I called Bill and I said, "So who's it going to be?" And he said, "I'm still thinking about it." Go pick up Kemp. Okay. So I'm getting ready to leave this office to go to the airport. And uh, I took with me all the materials for Connie Mack because I thought, well, what's going to happen? Do you have a sense of who the last, next to last man standing was? Well, yeah. Whether well, was, I'm, I, I, was. my sense was that it was Connie Mack. And I took the Connie Mack <coughs> file with me. Hmm. And I knew where the top four, where I could find them and how to get the hold of them by phone. And I knew that Kemp was flying from Florida, like Orlando or something, into uh, Dallas to give a speech. And so I went out to, the, to go pick up the plane. I stopped at the main terminal at Dallas to meet with the Bob Kimmett who had done this work for uh, George W. Bush, and Kemp was one of the finalists there, to talk with him about his hmm. uh, recollections of issues and, and that sort of thing. And Excuse me, I think you mean George H.W. Bush, right? George H.W. Yeah. Uh, and Kemet was, was <clears throat> the vetter. And he was coming back from it because I, as soon as the Kemp thing came, I thought I got to talk with Kimmet because mm. Kimmet had a lot of time to look at it, and Kimmet was in in Europe and was landing just about the time at mm. Dulles. So I met him at Dulles at the airport, and he gave me a little brief on on what he recalled from that. Then I got on the plane, Sheila and I, and and uh, Scott Reed's assistant, who I think was to keep an eye on us, uh, his little. Worker be there, and we flew up. And and you know when we were in the plane, we made, we called Dallas and got a limousine. You know it was just making it up as we go along. We, we get to uh, Dallas and we were going to pick him up in his hotel, but his plane was delayed, and so we ended up having to pick him up from the airport. And we go to where the uh, the terminal is. So he's a little station in the the Dallas airport and we'd landed at Love Field and that's where our plane was so we had to go to the 
take our limo to the, the big airport. We pull right up to that, and there's press everywhere, vans with the things. So we can't walk in there uh, like this. So we go down to the next uh, station in the terminal and talk to the people and talk our way to, uh, to go on the tarmac all the way down and then come right up from where when people get off the plane, you know, there's a little doorway that you come up. We were standing there. And so we're standing, waiting for the plane, waiting for the plane. The guy who's supposed to uh, the, supposed to meet Kemp there because they've arranged to have him give this speech is down in the uh, uh, main terminal waiting to pick up uh, <laughs> Kemp and apparently hears from somebody that we're down there. And so he comes charging down there uh, with somebody from the uh, airplane. And, and he asked Sheila this most unlikely question. And we, we sort of said, well, we're here to meet him. And, you know, Dolan wants to talk to him and whatever. And he says to us, well, are you going to take him if he doesn't want to go? I said, <laughs> what, we're going to pull out guns and drag him away, drug him? Was he afraid he was going to lose his speaker? Yeah. And, in fact, he did lose his speaker. <laughs> and so he's just panicked. You know, he's arranged this six months in advance. Kemp's arriving. He's waiting there. These people are going to spirit him away, which, indeed, we did. And it's funny. He comes off the plane, and he sees us there, and he says, Hi, Rod. Hi, Sheila. I say, hey, can you come this way? And there's this guy. I said, well, I introduced him to this guy who said he knew Kim from way back, because this guy w- was like a de- gold medal winner in the decathlon. Oh. I never heard of him. Okay. You know, he wasn't, he was before J- Bruce Jenner. Right. right. But he he was tight like that, and Kemp didn't recognize him. And afterwards, he said, who was that guy? I said, oh, he said, oh, yeah, now I remember, but... At any rate, we spirited him away and took him back to Love Field where we had arranged on the fly to get a conference room so that Dole could talk with uh, with him. And then they they had a conversation. And uh, uh, we waited for Dole to call back to see whether he was satisfied, which is quite awkward. Yeah. And the decision was made, I mean, that... Yeah, then, then then we got the green light, we got on the plane, we flew to some Air Force base in, near Russell, and we uh, we were there met by some advanced guys that took us to a hotel. turned out to be a hotel where a lot of press were staying, but we managed to slip in without them seeing it, and, and they gave me a hotel key. And I went out to get a Coke, and the door slammed behind me, so my key was sitting in there. And I thought, now I'm going to go up to the desk and sort of say, hey, uh, I'm Mr. <laughs> Mr. X. I didn't know what name I was checked under, but uh, but I just said, hey, you know, I'm in room such and such. My key slammed on the door. You know, and so they gave me another one, more honest. Folks. It wouldn't happen outside Kansas. Yeah, yeah. I want to back up one second yeah. because the, the decision to leave the Senate. How did that originate? And Sheila uh, would be okay. closer to that it, uh, because it, it it does sort of. Have I mean, I, I think it was. I think she was on the losing side of that's not a good idea, and Scott Reed wanted to. Scott was really pushing the notion that. Uh, that this was bogging him down into day-to-day minutia, so he couldn't concentrate on that. Plus, it exposed them to having to cast votes on things that might be damaging that you'd be better off not dealing with. And so he was really uh, pulling that. And, and was there a, uh, I mean, it, was, it wouldn't be the first campaign, I mean, I, I, reading between the lines, and my own experience, uh, I detect... That there was more than one camp, that the that the campaign folks, Scott, it was maybe a nice Maury, fight, like most. I most, mean, uh, what, did they look upon you? I mean, the old kind of Senate establishment yes. types as 
what, ideologically suspect? Or I think just suspect probably in every regard. I think probably less so me than, than Sheila. Uh, because she's seen as a closet moderate. Yeah, and, you know, she had had all of that, you know, attack on her from the right wing and the, all that press before that time. In New York Times with the horns and all of that. Uh, and, and I think it probably yeah, I was less threatening to them. And I had, you know, been a sort of a loyal soldier doing my thing, you know, running lawyers for Dole and the policy operation. And Did you have a sense, I mean, I have a sense with Maury there was a real ideological and cultural set of convictions there that reinforced whatever strategic or tactical advice she was giving. I, I, I don't have a sense with Scott. Uh, is Scott sort of a true believer or more, more a, no, uh, I, more a I, tactician? I think he's um, more of a tactician and not a true believer. I mean, the one thing that I found extremely distressing during that campaign was that when Woodward wrote his book that Scott, gave extensive comments uh, and obviously talked to him at length in ways that weren't helpful to the campaign. I thought that was unforgivable. If, it, if I had been dull, I would have fired him. But I'll tell you something. I heard um, from Elizabeth that they believe that Maury, um, um, among others, yeah. had had been chatting. Yeah, yeah. And um, and it contributed or reinforced a trait. Uh, a week before the convention, before the acceptance speech, I was um, in Grand Rapids at the Ford Museum. And I had a call. And... Um, First of all, she got on the line and talked about how, remember there was this whole Mark Helprin yeah. uh, romance that had been yeah. going on? And uh, he rode high for a while. Right. Okay. And But now the rubber meets the road. Well, and, 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 and actually that's almost, you could have probably uh, written in advance uh, sort of predicting uh, probably within a day or two when that call was going to occur because it always does. Well, when the <laughs> chips are down, let's, let's get wreck. Well, <laughs> but it was even by dull standards, this was surreal because, first of all, you get the call and it's control panic. It's not, I mean, they... they yeah. Um, because she, it was also sort of inconsistent because on the one hand, she wanted to bring in another voice, but at the same time with her predilection for preparation, she didn't want to upset the apple cart totally. She could, cause Bob had gotten comfortable. He had practiced. He well, was all ready to give uh, this speech. I will say the sort of, even with the rewrites, he did seem to practice this speech more than he had practiced before, and the results showed well that he that that, that with <clears throat> practice he he did a good job, and it was one of the better speeches that it gave. And her speech, <clears throat> yeah, is uh, was was a phenomenal yeah. uh, speech. I yeah. mean, you know, so much so that one of uh, well, there's a fellow here, now retired partner, that's teaching down at UVA Law School, and he teaches effective communication mm. and speaking. Mm. He asked me to get a copy of her. Really? Really? Or he, uh, well, he, it was very strange because, again, you've got, not for the first time, you've got diametrically opposing requests. In effect, we, we want you to look at this speech and sort of give us their candid, but then in, in the other ear you hear from her. Don't but, change but don't, it. Yeah, because don't he's, change it because he, he's, you know, he's, exactly. He's, all right. So then I'm sitting in the Ford Museum, and I said, okay, well, you know, here's the fax number. Well, at that point, they were so paranoid because of the Woodward book 
He said, no, I'll, I'll read it to you. So I'm going to listen to this draft Boy, that's over hard. the phone. That's, now, that's, that's kind of, you know, just that's, in terms of the way that you process <clears throat> things. Well, that would be pretty hard for me to do. It would be very hard, but it was. It, it also, I immediately, uh, frankly, my heart went out to him, because I I could imagine what brought him to that. Yeah, yeah. To, that is an extreme. Yeah. You know, okay, so um, he starts reading, and it's Halperin's, and it goes on and on and on about age. Oh, is it Halpern? Yeah, it's is a, reading Hel- you? No, no, Dole is reading Halpern's okay. draft, okay? okay? And and uh, you could turn age to your advantage. I mean, I actually had some ideas about how to do it, some of which he accepted at the end. But, I mean, uh, the problem was it dwelled on and on, and it was nostalgic. It made him look like he was looking back, and I, I mm-hmm. knew right away. Mm-hmm. You didn't have to be a genius to know the Clinton people are going to pounce on this and the old bridge to the yeah. future and all this stuff. But anyway, I remember, I'll never forget, he talked about the advantages of age and he used the word, uh, you know, perspective, but, but serenity. I said, wait a second, <laughs> stop right there. I said, you may be many things, but, but you you're not, not serene. serene. <laughs> I said, you know, you don't want to lose your audience in the first paragraph. And um, he actually laughed. He said, yeah, maybe we should change that word. <laughs> But anyway, so we went, through, we went through the whole thing. And I'm, I'm torn because what I'm listening to, and I'm trying to be as objective as possible, does not, by and large, sound like Dole or is the strongest way to turn his disadvantages to pluses. And it's not ego. It's not, you know. So anyway, it was a, it was a kind of, um, you know, non-committal sort of, it was just, breaking the ice. And I made a few modest suggestions, and particularly about the end and all that. So anyway, then of course you can imagine, you know, we get dragged into it. And at one point he says, don't you think you should come to San Diego? I said, son, I think that would be the worst thing in the world for me and for you. Because if I come to San Diego, someone's going to leak it. And for all we know, Halpern could have a fit and walk out. And then you've got, and of course, I never went to San Diego and Albert had a fit, um, which you also could have predicted. Yeah. You know, so in the end, it was just the last page, page and a half, really, that he used. But the, the, the irony was the most optimistic man in America was the line that was in the Times headline the next mm-hmm. day. Mm-hmm. The problem was <laughs> the first 90% of the speech. He sounded like the most pessimistic shit <laughs> in America. And then he sort of turned around, you know? But it was it was just I thought to myself, if if this is the, the way the campaign is functioning, then it's not looking yeah. good for Yeah, well it wasn't. Uh, I mean how much of a uh, struggle was there around Won the platform because you did have the. Well, I think there was uh, there was. I mean, it was a constant knife fight, and and uh, within the campaign, within the campaign, and and I don't know. Do you are you interviewing Dennis uh, Shea? I don't know if he's going to be on the list. Uh, well, I mean, he was running policy. He had yeah, a policy yeah. operation. Yeah, it, you you, you could probably sure. get a sense yeah. of uh, of. Because he was there every day, along with uh, uh, Greg Gross was his assistant. And was this, I mean, I don't want to oversimplify, was it a, kind of a the old hands versus the, the new hires? Yeah, yeah or, well, uh, and then, then after we got the nomination, then you had all the normal hangers-on that were there trying to find a role. The guy that's running McCain's campaign, Rick Zelter, or no, D- Davis, Davis, or whatever. Yeah, is that Rick Davis? Yeah, who I really didn't have a good feeling about. Right. And Charlie Black and all of these people suddenly showed up. You know, really? hey, we're the pros from Dover, and we're going to help. <laughs> yeah, Rumsfeld. And so you you sort of layered on. I was <coughs> most involved with coming up with a tax. Plan, which we 
came up with, and eventually. Now the that was the fifteen percent tax yeah, cut. Yeah. Um, which yeah became clearly the centerpiece of his. Yeah. Did he? And and did he sound know. like he believed it? Yeah, I think he did. Yeah. You know. No, and I I don't mean I mean, that's such a loaded question, but I mean, yeah. given the baggage. I mean, his reputation as a green eye shade, you right. know, budget balancer. It seemed like this kind of overnight conversion to. Uh, but he, you know, he had, you know, uh, me working on it, and Mark McConaughey, and and uh, uh, what's his name? Who was at the joint committee? Yeah, Ken Keys, and. Uh, Oh, gosh, some guys from Hoover. Okay. You know, it was a pretty good team of yeah. people, and we came up with a, a, I thought, a pretty good plan of how to make that all work. How much of that was kind of shouting into the wind, given the sense of prosperity I think was, and I, I balanced think it budgets? Was, and, I, I, mean, think, I think we were kind of shouting into the wind. I mean, I, it's not like that, that moved much or became a useful major theme. Was there any day during the campaign when you thought, hey, we just might pull this off? I mean, after the nomination. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't perceive that it was hopeless. That, that, and, and after I went to this Kennedy School thing, I thought, yeah, I should have been able to see that, but I didn't see it. You know, we just fought on. But, you know, as the polls were, you know, sort of in the campaign, I'm always hoping that there's going to be a miracle at the end. You know, the tumble from the stage and, you know, things. You know, it's fascinating to me. There have been a lot of people that uh, that I've uh, relatives and other people that will meet Dole and say, gee, I didn't realize he's a funny guy as he is. And I thought, God, you know, I guess that just never comes through. But it's, it's also like, where have you been the last 20 years? Yeah, that's, that's, but, you know, so many people have said that, and I'm thinking, that's, if anybody profiled him, they would say, you know, he's a naturally witty guy. He's always been that way. What about, I mean, I remember hearing uh, toward the end of the campaign, Second hand, um, that there was an incident, and I don't want to blow it out of proportion, but that I mean, it was typical that Dole came in one day and, you know, and I think people have been leaking. I think Sean Buckley. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, people yeah, did, yeah. And Dole said something to the effect that he didn't lose his temper, but he, he said, you, know, you, you don't know how hard it is to go out there every day, day after day after day. You know when you're getting beaten, head, you're beaten over the head, and the polls, you know, and to be upbeat and optimistic, and you know we're going to win this thing, and you know so on, so right. on, and sort of over your shoulder, you got people in your own camp who are, you know, yeah. talking uh, for some reason to their advantage and to your distance. Well, I mean, it was a leaky, leaky ship. I'll say that. You know, for instance, who we were looking at for vice president. I mean, it was, by and large, a very tightly controlled thing. Dole, I, and Scott Ree. Okay, in order for me to take an airplane, I had to have somebody in the campaign authorize the plane and whatever. <coughs> but, you know, I got up in the morning, went to church, went to a national airport, got on a plane by myself, went up, met with uh, Ridge, Flew back, had dinner guests that night. Never said uh, to right. a soul where I had been. Yep. And within two days, John King, of uh, who's now with ABC News, the, was I think with AP, writes the armament was up. So there's somebody had to do that. The same thing when I went to the Midwest. Within two days, they written the story, and I didn't tell anybody. Well, could it have been the candidate? I mean, uh, I mean, it would have been in some ways in Ridge's. Uh, yeah, but I don't think I don't think it was. They break the yeah. And 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 it became 
those leaks became so persistent that I got a call from what a, one of the ladies that I knew at, at ABC and say, hey, we're terribly sorry, Rod, but uh, don't be surprised if you find somebody's following you around because uh, we're always behind the story and we want to figure out who you're looking at. And so I, I, my son was then working up in the Senate as a, for a summer job as a page or something. And uh, he and I came out of the driveway of my house in Great Falls. And all of a sudden, uh, there was a car behind me, like, and I was just a little stunned because I thought I had not seen it. And it had been sort of pulled off alongside of the road and pulled out when I did. And, uh, and so I thought, then when he was just following me at every turn, I said, this bastard's following me. So I was driving a Porsche at the time. So, and I know the roads in Great Falls. So I, I just floored it, got up ahead, and then <coughs> went down some side roads and lost the guy. And, uh, and I saw the car sitting out in back of, because I had an office then on the back side of the building. I looked down and see him waiting for me to come out of the garage. Ooh. And every time I would get in my car, they would follow me. And so they picked me up in the morning and followed me all day. And I, I had a meeting uh, on a pension matter with uh, Goodling's folks up on the hill. And I was, it was on a Friday about this time of day that I had to be up there. So I got my car and drove up and parked there. And then I was going to pick up my son. And this woman parked behind me and followed about four steps behind me into the uh, Rayburn office building and stood out in the hall while I went in to meet with these people. And I sort of said, well, there's going to be a rumor that Goodling is a best president. <laughs> and I tried to find another way out of the thing, you know, <laughs> even crawling through the window and leaving this person. But it turned out there was no other way to get out of there. So she followed me yeah, back out of the building and... Uh, I went to pick up my son, and she followed me home. That's scary. I mean, that's really. Um, the debates, did Dole take them more seriously than uh, the one in 76? Yes, I, I think he, he worked pretty hard, and it turned out Kemp didn't take them seriously at all. That was a shock to me. Now, you know, I, we did not lose the this election because of Kemp. And indeed, Kemp was <clears throat> very disciplined and didn't, you know, whereas he was had a view of being sort of an uncontrolled missile, basically did what he was asked to do. If he was asked to go somewhere, he went there. He stayed on message, no gold bugs and stuff. You know, I Just, said, it's funny, the conversation we had with him and the other conversations I've had with him, I mean, I'm convinced that they're developed a, a genuine friendship and admiration yeah on on the part of yeah Kemp and and so, Kemp, which I mean, had not existed yeah, before not not but he he uh, he did his part but th- th- that was where i would have not imagined that he would fail and i don't think he, i don't think he's naturally good at debating which surprised me because he's such a talker and i don't think he prepared like he should have but that was that was a pretty poor performance. I mean, when Quayle was able to do a lot better than you are, that's that's a sort of a wake up call. <laughs> but at any rate, uh, uh, Kemp was. I think uh, some ways Kemp's never recovered from that. Yeah. I think it it it, it stamped him in a way that. Uh, yeah, it sort of showed sort of, a real weakness. Uh, yeah. That the idea of Kemp. Yeah, and and sort of, sort of, yeah, like he, he, I think, imagined himself to be a great intellectual, and and that sort of pulled away the veneer. Was Perot a factor at all? I don't think so. Yeah. This is somebody I was with a bunch of friends uh, uh, earlier in the week, and this is a group we'd normally used to go salmon fishing together in, in the summer 
but the guy that had the salmon fishing camp uh, at his disposal retired. So, <laughs> so we met for lunch and uh, talking politics. And uh, and one guy really wanted to talk about it. You know, is Gingrich going to get in? And I said, who cares? I mean, it, it doesn't much matter if he does or he doesn't. I don't think he's a factor. What? How? How Elizabeth? do during the campaign? Well, you know, I mean... Did she do a lot of independent campaigning? Yeah, she, she did a lot of independent campaigning, <coughs> and she was, you know, as Elizabeth, uh, was disciplined and uh, and cared about his well-being and, and always conscientious. You, you ask about women candidates. I mean, we had a little like, uh, effort with her to just think of women candidates, and we... We did an exercise of looking at every woman that had held uh, appointed office in any Republican administration. You know, anybody who had been an assistant secretary or cabinet officer. Or, it's just uh, a crazy question. Did Sandra Day O'Connor's name? I ever think come it up? was it was mentioned. That there was you know some university presidents that were mentioned and. Carla Hills, and you know, we 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 stretched to think of every potential woman mm. that that had some high profile in uh, in political life. But you know, the at least at that time, it would be less true now. I mean, you know, you have people like Condoleezza Rice or whatever that are that have occupied significant positions. There's sort of the universe of people that would qualify yeah. with a lot of high-level government experience, right. like a Cheney. There isn't a big list. Was he, at any point in that phone campaign, relaxed? I don't, not that I saw that he was relaxed, but I, I think it? that... I think that there were uh, that he was less agitated than he uh, had every right to be. That he that he that that he, that he wasn't uh, as as grumpy as yeah. I mean, you know, say 1980 or even yeah. in '88. Yeah, there is this bizarre. Quasi Freudian, I don't know what the origins of it are. Uh, notion that for him, winning the nomination was everything. That right. that you know, win, you know, winning the election would have been almost was, too much to really yeah, expect. Yeah, but, but, but getting the but nomination have, had been sort of a quest, almost a lifelong quest. Right. I mean, you wonder whether there's this, again, this notion, this side of goal that um, looks down the road and sees the, the opposition and figures that, you know, much as he might deserve something, you know, it's it's not going to come, not come his happen. way. Yeah. Yeah. And to, so to win the nomination is a kind of validation of your life's yeah. work. And well, given that he had sort of contested for it, multiple times and come pretty close. Well, Did, did a, you ever see him really down during that campaign? Not really. Or was it kind of an equilibrium? Yeah, he's an equilibrium and, and uh, he's uh, got such remarkable resilience. Was there ever a time I mean, now you did that last, and remember in October, finally you get some breaks because of the fundraising stories. Right. And uh, on the other hand, you also got a more or less open campaign by some Republicans to, you know, well, never mind about Bob Dole, but, you know, we got to keep yeah, Congress, yeah, yeah. you know. I mean, how did he handle that? And, of course, there is the argument that actually he, he contributed to the Republicans keeping Congress, that uh, yeah. the last... Uh, yeah, people. Campaign. People wanted divided government, so that uh, yeah. Well, uh, you know, I wasn't there with him day to day, so it's hard to say that he was not down. But he 
he he really did soldier on in the way that you were describing how he's sort of saying, hey, how do I keep upbeat and keep the uh, uh, the notion alive that we're not going to lose? Was there a scenario that by which you could win? I mean, or I mean, how late? Well, I believed we could win. I mean, you could put together two hundred seventy electoral the, votes. Yeah, yeah. But, but despite the uh, and were uh, your polls more or less in agreement? I mean, because there are a lot of public polls. You look at the CNN tracking poll and the Times poll; they were showing twenty, twenty-five point gaps for most of the campaign. Yeah, but and and we'll, and then at know, the end, it yeah, it tightened. So, so I I I was looking for uh, the miracle, the the. Uh, Despite all the odds, it turns out well for us. Because I didn't want, I, I, you know, I wasn't prepared to concede it. Do you know there was a concession speech? Was there ever a victory speech written? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer and to that. And did he ever talk about a cabinet? Yeah, but I think he thought that it was. Yeah, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's not like we did any planning. No, it's kind of a yeah. game. Yeah. What about, I mean, since then? How, I mean, there was a school of thought that in a lot of ways time has been very good to Bob Dole. That um, who knows what kind of president he would have made. Yeah. But that in a curious sort of way, he became the perfect on Clinton. I mean, he he, he is... The things that in some ways worked against him in 96, later on actually came to work well, in his he favor. Had his, he had his The war career. record. Yeah. I mean, he became this kind of national grandfather, the face of the World War II generation. Yeah, the, he, yeah, the, the, the memorial. The, the mall thing he threw himself into. He he had his sense of humor came out in his TV ads. Well, yeah, this whole uh, sort of... Re- he made money, whereas, it, you know, he always grew up desperately poor... And I think he was always felt bad about that. And he made money. And I think the significance for the money is not him personally, because I don't think he ever needed it or wanted it personally, but, you know, to take care of his relatives. And I think, you know, that he's made sure who, that... Who, who needed some taking care yeah, of. Yeah, yeah. So that uh, that, I think, has given him a lot of satisfaction that he's been able to... Uh, to do something for for those people that needed it, I mean, the, the fact is, I'm sure he's done quite well himself. But I mean, sure. his lifestyle is no different than if yeah. he hadn't done that. I mean, it's pretty much the same lifestyle. And uh, and then I think he gets some gratification with Elizabeth uh, going in the Senate. Was he? Um a significant, I mean, I'm sure he was a significant advisor. Was he a significant cheerleader for her running um, for the presidency when she did? I guess so. I mean, you know that that uh, that effort was so uh, that was even less than 1980 in terms of his effort. But I think he, you know, had hoped, and I I did what I could on that campaign. What haven't we covered? Does he miss the Senate? Does he miss the Senate? Uh, I think he, he does. I mean, I think he he stays in close touch. I mean, I I think he was when he was honored with his you know the portrait ceremony was something that uh, I think he enjoyed. He gets a you know I think he dabbles around enough to. To enjoy it, but I think I have a sense that he's in a. You're talking about uh, time being kind to him. I think that he's in a uh, a very good place in his life in these years. That he's uh, sort of content. He's made money. He, you know, he doesn't like he needs to make any more. He's helped build two different law firms. Uh, he's seen Elizabeth. Uh, you know, and I'm sure he put a lot of psychic energy into that and, and advising her behind the scenes. Uh, 
He's, be, yeah. and he's become so. This, I mean, I think you know, and he's he's kind know. of a pop figure too. I mean, yeah. the, the ads and everything else made him this kind of unlikely cultural icon. In and, some ways. and you know, he's he's been able to do you know a lot of public. You know, it's the just the the uh, Walter Reed Commission uh, the. Uh, and the whole Bosnian, Bosnian how, how MIAs, uh, you know, I think, you know, when people sort of say, who can we do some of these things, they think of him because he's willing to do it, and I think he throws himself into it and puts a lot of energy in it. Uh, you know, so he's able to uh, to make a difference in terms of the, the uh, doing good for society, so... So I mean I, I do think that he seems very content and you, you know. think he uh, is 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 aging a burden? Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, you it's know, fascinating when we when we said series of him, falls and stuff. Uh, it was almost as if unconsciously he was showing off. He had extraordinary recall, and he would, in ways that you didn't need to do, almost as a kind of mental exercise, he would go back 50 years in time and he'd give you a name and and, and, a, and, a, and the kind of, you know, detail that would, you know, yeah. just to show that, you know. He could do it. That yeah. he could still do it. Yeah. And, um, well, you know, you don't have a sense that he has slipped mentally. Physically... Uh, from time to time, he just seemed very thin, yeah. uh, and and sort of somewhat frail. I mean, I I've visited him a couple of times in the hospital, so at that point he's not at his well. At one point, after I think he'd fallen, that's where he kind of cut up yes. his eye and yes. stuff. He just seemed, because he was in sort of hospital gowns, and you could see his legs, and his legs are, I have big, thick legs, and, and he's got skinny legs yeah. to begin with, but he yeah. was, he just seemed really thin. Yeah. Now, he's put on some weight, and they, they have him drinking and sure and stuff, so so that's a good thing. Um, but, uh, you know, he seems to have recovered from that pretty well, and... Uh, um, so he seems to be doing somewhat he, better, but I, you know, I think he's physically uh, not what he was. I mean, it's funny. We we went over to uh, Bob Lighthizer and Sheila and I went over to his office to uh, to all go up together to uh, I think to see Ronald Reagan lying in state. You know, in the Capitol, and he was going to get us in, so we didn't have to wait in line. It turned mm. out that Sheila actually had arranged it. So, but at any <laughs> rate, uh, uh, Bob Lighthizer uh, said to me when we were going there, he said, "Do you realize that we're the same age now as Bob Dole was when we went to work for him?" <laughs> I don't know how many years ago that was, but he was must have been in his mid to late fifties, and that's what we were at the time. Now I'm fifty nine, and so is Bob. So maybe fifty seven or something, and that's kind of a shock too that you've <laughs> re you've reached this point. Uh, and I thought he was uh, a pretty old guy. Can you think of a st one thing? I mean. You know, putting aside your personal feelings, historically, what, what, what's Bob Dole's place? I mean, you know, he will have to go down as one of the great legislators uh, in the nation's history, and you sort of think of programs that he was involved in, uh, you know, tax increase, tax cut, food stamps, disability legislation that 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 probably would be first and foremost 
of, of what he'd, his place in history will be. I mean, the fact that somebody ran for presidency and lost is... Well, it admits you to a, a small club. Yeah, a small club, and, you know. uh, and, and you know, he and other things you ran for vice back. president as well. So. Yeah. You can step back and see through his. You can see through the prism of his career, the transformation of the Republican Party. I mean, yeah. say seventy six, yeah, I mean, ninety six. That, that would be, you know. Uh, you know, I mean, he could be a case study for that. Uh, In some cases, it was almost like he was chasing the bus. I mean, it's, <laughs> it was turning right, Tur- and, uh, turning right, and. So. <laughs> Well, listen, thank you very much. Um, off the record, I, I just 